the value of an engineering company today is mainly the stuff that is in the head of the engineers that are employed by this company. In software, it's different. Engineers work the same way they work back uh, in the Roman ages when they envision something and they try to draw it. A low code is only a temporary stage because as I explained, people don't know how to code, so they will be intrigued to do low code. But it doesn't really make sense in the long term if you say we want to encode engineering knowledge. Um, coding is very elegant. So whenever you look at the design of someone else, you kind of have to re-engineer of what this guy was thinking when he was building this motor or when he was trying to build a new airplane and so on. While in, in the software approach, you write the rules of how objects are built. And then the final result, the geometry as an output is just the consequence of going through this process. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new podcast episode today with the awesome Josefina Listener. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello. I think I'm we've Yusef. been connected. Yeah, hi. I think we've been connected for quite some time on LinkedIn. So finally, today is the day where we record this podcast together. And today yes. is all about computational engineering and the future of CAD. But before we jump straight into that, Josefina, give us kind of a, a brief introduction. Who is Josefina in the first place and what are you doing? Um. Well, uh, my name is Josephine. Most of uh, you know me from a project I did two years ago, which was the first computationally engineered aerospike engine, which was my master thesis back then. So I'm an aerospace engineer and um, I went through a traditional education and then got interested into coding. And now I'm trying to combine these two things. Really interesting. Um so as I said, we talk about computational engineering, and I think a lot of people in the audience would be interested, what is computational engineering in the first place? And how does it differ from the classical approach, how engineers usually develop parts or assemblies? Yeah. So how engineers typically work is using a CAD program, which is computer-aided design, which means that if I speak boldly, engineers work the same way they work back uh, in the Roman ages when they envision something and they try to draw it. Uh, back then, they tried to draw it on a piece of paper. Today, they try to draw it with the help of a computer in 3D. But the essence is that it's still a very visual, manual process. And in the age of software, where software dominates so much of our life, there's actually a lot of functionality from software development that you could now apply into how engineering works. And in the, into the design process, most, most specifically, and computational engineering is basically a new paradigm where the engineer doesn't draw anymore. Um, while he is following an algorithm in his head, he just writes these rules that he follows anyway when he draws something on screen. Instead of drawing it, he in describes the rules in a computer readable language, and then the computer does all the uh, ge geometry shape generation. That is what engineers in the CAD program spend most of their time on. And if a computer does it, it's, of course, way faster. And you are encapsulating this thought process rather than just uh, showing someone the, uh, the final visual result. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So what is the, the advantage of having kind of these building blocks and kind of have the dependencies of information flow be between these blocks? Why mm -hmm. does it help us engineers? I mean, I touched on it. The, the, um, the main point is that you encapsulate the thought process. And um, it, this is a big deal, actually, when you think of it, because uh, you know the golden age when we flew to the moon and engineers built the Saturn V rocket and so on. They did a lot of testing back then and they learned a lot about rockets. But today, actually, we can't build the same rockets anymore because this knowledge got lost over the past decades, which is kind mm -hmm. of insane, right? You would think in spaceflight we are much more ahead than we were back in the 60s. But in fact, engineering knowledge gets lost because the only way we store engineering design is by the objects that we design, but the thought process gets lost. Um, so whenever you look at the design of someone else, you kind of have to re-engineer of what this guy was thinking when he was building this motor or when he was trying to build a new airplane and so on. While in, in the software approach, you write the rules of how objects are built. And then the final result, the geometry as an output, is just the consequence of going through this process. And that's a fundamentally different perspective. And uh, we have seen that work very well in the software and computing industry because there all you do is 
encoding uh, processes and functionality. You don't actually, you're not obsessed with the one output, you're obsessed with getting the process right that produces a good output. Mm -hmm. So engineering is kind of the other way around at the moment. You're thinking of the final result and then you kind of figure out what the way is to get to that point. But if something goes wrong, you should actually fix the process rather than kind of tweaking the result until you kind of there. It's a bit messy and unclean if you come from yeah. a software perspective. This is kind of your belief also at Leap, Leap 71. So I think it's quite straightforward if you tell it to a company, for example, that they sh should use more this kind of process-based approach, this logical approach, which kind of reminds me, if we go back to Simulink, like kind of these building blocks, how you build the logic, et cetera. But what is in for the end user? Because we always think about, okay, like I'm yourself, I put in my knowledge into this building blocks, into this logic, but mm. am I not giving my knowledge away for free? So the next engineer takes basically my knowledge. And I'm kind of a, maybe a bit, I wouldn't say jealous, but maybe I don't want to give my knowledge away for free. So how can we overcome this kind of mental barrier, so to speak, for engineers that they move away from this traditional approach to this more modern approach using the building blocks? Um, oh, okay. So there are different perspectives that you touch on. Um, first of all, uh, when I engaged on becoming a computational engineer, initially it was very hard because I didn't know how to code. I was mm. very slow. I needed to figure out everything from scratch because there is no rule book of how to do it, right? Um, but what I witnessed over the past two years doing that is that your personal work gets so much accelerated because you never do something twice. In software, mm -hmm. if you have a rule that works, so if I have a function that generates a pipe or a flange, whatever, um, I can just reuse this function until the day, the day ends, basically. Uh, unless I find something that is fundamentally wrong with this module, I can just use it and reuse it. And so over the past two years, I actually built up a large library of all sorts of engineering objects that Today, my work is so much faster because I can just go copy paste from all sorts of things and tweak them slightly and I get to my result much faster. And um, I mean, that should be the goal of every engineer because it's actually quite frustrating to be an engineer if you do the same things over and over again. And I can mm -hmm. tell you that because uh, I used to work in Formula One, which is a great job and it's super exciting. But the reality is that you draw the same little winglet again and again, and then a little different variation again. And um, this is not what engineers should be doing. And I don't think anyone studies to become an engineer just to do the same bracket again and again. So what mm -hmm. it does, it frees you up to do the exciting stuff and you automate everything you have done in the past and you build on top of everything you've done in the past. So that's a personal motivation and that should be, I think, inherit to any engineer because we want to build interesting stuff. We don't want to build the same stuff again and then tweak it slightly and do it slightly different and do it again and so on. So that's the engineering perspective. Um, from a company point of view, you are often faced with the problem that you have a few superstars in your company that have skills that other people don't have yet. Mm -hmm. um, they can do stuff that no one else can do. They are chronically overworked um, and the knowledge doesn't get shared and doesn't get transcribed. If they get hit by a bus or if they uh, retire, then knowledge also gets lost, as I explained before. And it's also a problem for, for an engineering company because the value of an engineering company today is mainly the stuff that is in the head of the engineers that are employed by this company. In software, it's different. If you look at a software company um, that has, I don't know, let's say Adobe, because that's an obvious example. Um, they have engineers, yes, but they also have the source code of Photoshop. And that is a lot worth independent of who is working in this company. And uh, this is not true for engineering companies at the moment. And that's a huge potential. I mean, if uh, if a company has the source code for the most efficient electric motor, that's great because that's independent. That's an independent IP pillar of uh, the people that work for this company. And so this should be the motivation. And also, if you apply this paradigm for generative design thoroughly within a the company, then uh, I think it's game over for every other company in that field. Because if you are the first company who, let's say, uh, gets a algorithmically engineered rocket engine to work, 
where from that point onwards, you will be so much faster in improving the design that no other company will keep up, no matter how many people they throw at the job to try and re-engineer it manually. There is just no comparison between the two. Um, so I think these are the two standpoints. And um, it's not about, so you can choose to share your, uh, your knowledge, of course, but you can also build a lot of um, business models around that if you're worried. I mean, you're not forced to open source stuff. That was a conscious decision by Leap71 to open source some of our stuff. We can talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, definitely. We'll talk also about the implementation aspect of this whole um, process-based thinking in a, in a little bit. But yeah, Leap71, Josefine, tell us a little bit more about Leap71. Where did you kind of identify, I would call it, a gap in the market? Because I think your biggest strength <laughs> is also kind of producing or generating very complex shapes because what I've seen is like mind-blowing. Like it's, yeah. it's crazy what you guys are doing. So yeah. maybe just explain us what is Leap71 up to? Yeah, I mean, Leap71 is a very young company. I started it earlier this year. We are based in Dubai, uh, which might seem like an unconventional choice. Um, and yeah, so it started with me being frustrated with what the perception of generative design, uh, design for additive manufacturing, what this is in the industry right now. Because um, again, if I'm rude, everyone is doing gyroids and then they tell you this is like the solution to saving the world and uh, heat exchangers are gyroids and uh, I don't know, everything is a gyroid. And um, gyroids are pretty trivial <laughs> um, and uh, they're not optimal for many things. Like in my designs, gyroids are like, I don't know, the last 2%. If I feel like I need to take out some weight, okay, let's do a gyro at the very end. But mm -hmm. um, I don't think it makes the value of a good good product or a good design. And um, I started with that when I was still at Hypergenic that I would build very complex objects through computer code. And I think I was really the first one doing that and showcasing that it's possible. And uh, Leap71 is just taking this further and we don't want to focus on the obvious cases that everyone is kind of uh, scrambling around, which is like single parts, light weighing, lattices, stuff like that. There are a million companies doing that. And that's fine because these are the, the first uh, applications that, that are coming. But what really interests me are the complex stuff, entire machineries, co uh, complete thrust chamber assemblies. And this is actually perfect for a computational approach. This is huge software development, but uh, the more complex your thing is, the more you want it to be automated and interlinked and talking to each other. And uh, we are very early in this stage. I mean, every project that I engage on is basically a new kind of object and I don't know how it will turn out, um, but it's incredibly exciting. And I think with Leap, we now actually focus on these things that no one else really dares to do. And uh, we thrive on these things. So we will explicitly not do gyroids. You will not see anything like that or lettuces or you will not see that stuff from Leap 71. Um, but you will see rocket engines, you will see electric motors, you will see large airframes, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. And if, it's, if anyone is interested in listening to this podcast of how that stuff actually looks like, make sure to follow Josefina on Instagram and or LinkedIn because you're posting regularly um, amazing stuff. So make sure to check that one out. How do yeah. companies actually perceive that, Josefina? Like, do they, are they very open-minded when it comes to actually producing these uh, complex geometries or are they more like a bit hesitant <laughs> and thinking, I'm not really sure what to do with it. We're not ready yet. How yeah. does that look like? Uh, it's a mixture. So some people look at it like, oh, this is art, this is bullshit, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, these are the moments when I'm kind of disappointed that actually engineers don't have a lot of imagination. Like you show them the most fancy uh, multi-material 3D printed electric motor, first of its kind, and they're like, yeah, but there, this little corner doesn't look like it would actually function. And you're like, oh, this is... <laughs> This is not what this is about, <laughs> okay? But uh, yeah, we're obviously working on, so we are, we are playing on the whole spectrum. Obviously yeah. I do these outrageous showcases. I do them just to show what's possible. And this is what interests, what gets people interested. And I think 
I, I get a lot of messages from young engineers and they say like, oh, I want to be able to build this. This is like why I want to become an engineer and this is what, this is what excites me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's young engineers. Then when you talk to executives, it's obviously different. <laughs> um, and um, it, it's just a spectrum. I mean, our, the projects that we do, they are, they're much more rooted in practical stuff. But of course, you have to play on the whole thing because otherwise you get too much stuck in where the mindset of the industry is right now. And that's also a problem because then you're not moving anymore. So I, I do intentionally like to do these showcases just to like free up my mind and say, okay, let's look at a certain type of object from scratch, not, uh, not answer someone's demand on he wants a little bit improvement here and there, but look at them from scratch. And this is also what uh, kind of inventing this new paradigm and method encourages because in the CAD world, you know how objects look like because they have been drawn with this method, so they always look similar. Um, for me, it's very often that I just completely start from scratch. And then of course, you start to think of certain objects with completely fresh eyes and you do them differently. You do them with the intent to be 3D printed right from the start. You don't try to re-engineer it in afterwards. And this is what I like about this whole thing. And no. sorry. <laughs> it's, it's also interesting because I'm not focusing on one specific object, right? I mean, there are specialists who only do heat exchangers or only do bioprinting and so on. And I kind of jump from one topic to another. And it's kind, it's novel in the engineering world that you're not specialized. That I see myself as a generalist. And again, with a computational approach, you're kind of more abstract because you start to see the cross connections and you try to capture the abstract thing that com that re that unites different areas and then you find that a rocket engine has certain principles that are similar to a heat exchanger so i try to write an kind of abstract bit of code that captures both and then from those i can go more into the specifics and um, it gives you an interesting new perspective on engineering and it's not the, the traditional Oh, I'm very specialized in this field and I'm very specialized into that field. And I would never talk to this guy because he's specialized in something else. So, um, that, that makes, yeah. a, makes absolute sense. We'll talk about the uh, peacock, um, something that you released last mm. week, uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, I wanted to talk about maybe one last thing, which is kind of a tipping point. Do you feel like the tipping point to creating these complex geometries was more like a bottleneck in terms of manufacturing capabilities, manufacturing techniques, or was it more the algorithms or was it both? <laughs> because I haven't, I haven't um, seen some, well, something like this, to be honest, before. Like before I discovered Leap 71, I have to tell you. You haven't or you have? I haven't seen such complex ah, okay. geometries <laughs> before I met you guys. Um, I think, honestly, it's a mindset thing. It's um, okay. So it, th I think the root cause is actually that engineers don't learn how to code to start with. Mm. So their entire mindset is... Is, uh, it gravitates towards this visual approach. And I had that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I realized that our entire world is dictated by software. I want to be an engineer in the 21st century. I don't know how to code. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I should learn it. Apparently not many people realize that. But um, I found it to be incredibly exciting to be able to learn coding because it's such a creative process. There is, there's almost nothing that you can not do um, if you find the right words. So you basically have to, you can imagine anything and then you need to find the way how to get the computer to do it. But other than that, there are not many limits. It's not like hardware that is dictated by, so, uh, by, by physics. Um, software is much more free in that regard in terms of what you can do. So I think it's, yeah. mainly, um, it's mainly the educational aspect. So that kind of assumes or supposes that there's kind of a two class society emerging from that, where it's like on one, in one <laughs> part you have kind of the high code um, fans, I would call it. And then the other part, you have kind of the low code fans. Yeah. What do you think makes more sense from an engineering point of view? Yeah, I mean, there is this split in the generative design field mm. that many people or many solutions you see are um, user interface applications black box and low code. This is how they get marketed. And I think they are pretty successful because it speaks to an engineer that is at his core lazy 
and unhappy or, or happy with like uh, having a running system. Sadly, that's the truth. Like I spend a lot of time with engineers and most of them are actually not as adventurous as you would like them to be. So it speaks to them. Um, I get incredibly frustrated with uh, closed black box things because uh, they're, they're almost, they're often almost doing what you want, but not exactly what you want. And then you would like to kind of go into it and tweak it yourself. And I think that's also part of the learning process. So there's the spectrum and Leap71 is obviously on the far end of full code. So I think that uh, low code is only a temporary stage because as I explained, people don't know how to code, so they will be intrigued to do low code. But it doesn't really make sense in the long term if you say we want to encode engineering knowledge. Um, coding is very elegant. I don't think that putting it into little boxes and making colorful like displays around it uh, gives it any benefit. But um, I, I thrive on abstract things, so uh, I understand that there, that there is a range to it. But if you want to express information, then code is the most dense way you can do it. And if you get to cl complex stuff like I do, there would be no way to do it visually. I mean, the screen that I would need with filling it with boxes would be absolutely insane. It's like looking at the metro map of Tokyo. <laughs> you look at it for an hour and you still haven't found what's going on. So I think the more we go into this complex territory, the more code, pure code, uh, makes sense. And I mean software for, I don't know, for, for everything that is on the internet is written in uh, pure code. So. I think it's natural to go this way because it has worked in the computing industry anyway. Uh, it's just a matter of getting engineering over to that, which has already been proven to be very successful. It has given us Moore's law. It has done so much innovation. So I don't even know why people are hesitant to adopt this paradigm because it has proven to be so much more innovative than what we've seen in engineering at the physical world. So, yeah. yeah. So th this pure code approach will initially only attract a few people, I would say. Um, but it will give those people so much more firepower. It will make them scale so much more. And this, again, people are not aware that if you look at modern software companies, for example, Midjourney, they do this generative AI for images. These are 11 people or something like that. It's a company that is, has so much, like contributed so much worth. It's 11 people. Um, so software people can scale so much more than manually working people, even if they're good or average, the difference is minor, but a software guy can do what other, what a bad software guy cannot do a good one. Yeah. Leverage is so. the key. I think we'll extract exactly that a clip for all the generative, uh, design enthusiasts who are like on the <laughs> low code side of things. Let's see, M might be both <laughs> and what I really like about you, Josefina and Lynn as well is that you at Leap 71, you're kind of very open-minded. And I think this is something we need kind of a breath of fresh air in the engineering industry because it feels like a bit tedious and boring yeah. nowadays. Everyone is doing the same thing. Everyone is having the same message. It's yeah. kind of getting a bit boring and, and unexciting. Yeah. Which, yes. Which, yeah. Exactly. So Peacock. that brings us to the point of Peacock. So can you quickly explain what Peacock is all about? And you kind of open source it last week, if that's correct, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, if you do computational engineering, you need a programmable geometry kernel that actually outputs the geometry. So it takes in some code commands and it will give you the final shape that you can then put on a 3D printer, for example. And um, in the industry, there are many different ways of doing that, many approaches. But as you say, it's very closed source. Everyone sits on this platform and it's kind of hidden how you do things and... Um, I think that's actually a problem um, because it's a trust issue. When you think of uh, big cat companies, they're huge companies. They have been around for 30 years and they will, well, you trust them. They exist. They will continue to exist. So um, generative design is a very new field and it's largely driven by small companies and startups. And um I mean, startups are inherently unstable. They can disappear from one 
day to the next, they can decide, oh, we change our business model. Um, now it's not free anymore or we do something else. We change whatever. Um, and we thought that whatever new movement you want to implement, it needs to be rooted in open source. At least there needs to be an open source fallback mm -hmm. because also engineering is very sensitive to protecting their stuff. So if an engineering company now says, okay, we want to do computational engineering. So we pick this one platform and we start to encode all our work, all our knowledge. We are kind of dependent on that platform, right? Um, and in programming, that actually happened a few times in the past that there was a, a programming language that was available for a while. So people would start developing all their work on it. And then at some point, I don't know, Microsoft or someone said, oh, actually, we are not doing this anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. So we stop supporting it. We just kill mm -hmm. it. And I mean, that's then from one day to the next, you stand there and all of your work is gone because your foundation has been ripped away. Yeah. And uh, this is the state of, of generative design at the moment. There is no fallback option. And today, most uh, programming languages have a open source variant to it. So C Sharp, for example, that we use, there's an open source variation to it. Swift from Apple is open sourced. Um, and we just realized that we should probably do the same for computational engineering. Otherwise, there will always be this trust, trust issue. And we don't, didn't see anyone doing it because uh, most other companies actually, they monetize their platform. So why would they open source it? Um, and so we developed over the past months since we started uh, Leap71, a very small compact geometry kernel um, called Peacock. So a uh, Pico for small and then GK for geometry kernel. And the fun of it is that it's pronounced peacock, which is a, um, a, a basically a reference to uh, Dubai where you have wild peacocks running in the streets. It's mm -hmm. a big deal when a peacock crosses the street and so on. So yeah. And um, it's intentionally kept very small. So it's, um, it's developed after a um, reduced instruction set because what we realized is that for my stuff to, for my work, basically I only need a few functions. It's like 20 functions or something that I need. Everything else I can write myself in C sharp, but there are a few functions that are uh, performance critical. So they are in Peacock, they are optimized, they're written in C++. And um, we open sourced it last week. So it's on our GitHub for Leap71. The initial release is for Mac only because we are a Mac only company, but they will follow a, a Windows version as well very soon. And well, we just hope that people can use it and um, that they don't need to deal with the problem of, of selecting a, um, a uh, well, building a ge geometry kernel themselves or selecting a company and having trouble. So it's very easy to just get started. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, you don't need to reinvent a geometry kernel and we don't think that this is kind of the core IP of what we do. We are an engineering company, um, and we rather have people use it than kind of desperately try to make a business model around it. And we think that this yeah. can actually start a movement. Absolutely, I uh, 100% think so as well. And um, what is kind of because you talked about the business model, what is kind of the added benefit of you open sourcing this and kind of from business perspective, like what is your added value that you bring to companies? Is it more like the service <laughs> or the expertise? Uh, so okay, so open sourcing doesn't have a business model, really. <laughs> so I mean, like open source for, for the geometry. Yeah, because you open source it, you could have also like taken a, I don't know, a fee for it, like a monthly fee, for example. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, we want this to be trusted and we think mm -hmm. that everything you build on top will be trusted more because there is this open source base layer. Mm -hmm. And now uh, okay. when you look at our work, it has multiple layers. So the base layer is Peacock. It's a geometry kernel. It has very basic commands like set voxel, um, translate mesh, add triangle, export SDL, like stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, on top of that, I have also open sourced a library that I call shape kernel that helps you to generate primitives as you know them from CAD, a little bit more advanced, um, but like uh, 
uh, I mean, cylinders, boxes, you can modulate them and so on. So it's kind of the basic vocabulary. Um, and on top of that, I do engineering. So these two layers have nothing to do with engineering, but everything I do, uh, all our computational engineering models, they are funneled through these two base layers. Got it. Okay. Which means that with the stuff that we have open sourced, everyone now can do exactly the same stuff that Leap71 showcases. So you can write your own engineering code, and in theory, you can do the same stuff that we show. There is nothing else other than our engineering library that we ha have accumulated over the past months. Um, and this is also interesting because now you have a free software and all you need is a laptop. And I personally, I work on a MacBook Air, so it's really nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. um, and I can produce very exciting novel designs. And I, if you think of young people who might not have access to engineering software or fancy hardware, that could be interesting. What you need is a laptop and the willingness to learn coding. That's really cool. What is your the, the primary target persona for, for Peacock in the first place? Like, we're more thinking about companies, maybe having a fallback option, as we've talked about, uh, Josefina, mm -hmm. or like who is the actual target persona and um, how can people actually contribute to Peacock and the, the project itself? Um, the target audience is very broad. So first of all, it's everyone who just wants to tinker around, learn to be a computation engineer, mm -hmm. because that's also a hurdle if you don't really know what to expect, but you have to pay money in advance or you have to go through some complex whatever, it might actually scare you away. So if you don't know whether it's useful, you just want to have something for free to tinker around. Okay, so that's those people. Um, but it's also intended for commercial in entities. So it is a foundation for, or an invitation actually, for a company to say, okay, I base, I do something similar, but more advanced. I base it on Peacock, but I add features onto it. So someone who uses Peacock, but wants to have enhanced performance or additional simulation capabilities or this and that feature, yeah, then be, by, be my guest and become a customer of my company. But it is this fallback option of everything you do on Peacock works on Peacock and there are add-ons. And there's plenty of opportunity. I mean, um, many companies actually build on open source foundation. If you look at Android, for example, if you look at anything that works on Linux, mm -hmm. so um, very often these open source foundations encourage a ecosystem that has not only academic students and so on, but also a entire commercial branch to it. Absolutely. Like apart from your mission or kind of the vision to kind of start a movement with Peacock, what is kind of the, the long-term goal for, for Leap71? Let's say, think about 2030, 2050, what do you think about? Yeah. Oh, that's long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the goal is to to be the pinnacle and the pioneer of uh, computational engineering. As I said, we want to uh, explicitly tackle those uh, applications that no one else is really tackling yet. So uh, we go ahead and say, someone has an interesting printer capability. They have no clue what to do with it. Uh, let's do something that... Uh, so an example for that would be our collaboration with the Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, they have this multi-material printer, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, well, they haven't shown anything like what we have done in the past. And we just said, okay, let's use this and see whether we can build an electric motor with it. And uh, really I think cool. this leads to in some interesting developments. Um, I mean, we are predominantly a engineering company. So right now we do specific customer projects. And uh, how it usually works is that um, I do the initial coding uh, on, on Peacock um, based on their requirements. It's a big back, back and forth. And then uh, at the end, I do a code handover. I see. Because I want to do new stuff all the time. I thrive on tackling new stuff. So I don't actually want to drag on projects for too long. And what I rather do is... Uh, enable people who want to get into computational engineering by just giving them a project or a code that is already useful for them and then they can take over the development in-house. Yeah, that That's kind of sense. the goal. Yeah. Really and cool. I mean, long-term, lo this is kind of, these projects are 
well, what we got started with, but uh, we published this um, computational engineering model on uh, rocket propulsion systems, RPCM. Mm -hmm. And so the long-term goal is actually build these computational engineering models for strategic areas. So we start with rocket propulsion because my background is there. I know a lot how to do that. Um, also electric mobility and a few others. And um, we think that the value itself will lie in these computational engineering models. It's a little bit like ChatGPT being very uh, valuable because it's a very powerful thing um, that a lot of people can use in the field to then generate value from it. And, uh, well, this will potentially become our product. And we transition into holding the IP or holding ownership of these computational engineering models. Absolutely. I'm super excited, Josephine. I think you will have will have a lot of success because I, I kind of feel the passion that you have, like how you talk <laughs> about it, etc. But also the, the stuff that you're doing is really, really insightful. And I think there will definitely be a movement in terms of computational engineering. And I'm more than happy to kind of like share the word and uh, share also obviously Peacock with my community to make sure to give it a try. And um, let's see where people end up. Any mm -hmm. last remaining motivating words to the maybe engineering community out there, Josefina, from your end? <laughs> uh, motivating words. Yeah, I mean, reflect whether your job is interesting enough <laughs> or whether you're, you're spending too much time on uh, doing the same things again and again. I mean, what I tremendously enjoy about my job is that I actually, I jump between topics so much. It's, I mean, I enjoy that a lot and you get a higher perspective on how things work together and multidisciplinary, I think is incredibly important for smart and elegant engineering designs. So, um, yeah, challenge yourself. And if you're an engineer and your aspiration should be to uh, invent the future, so make sure you're contributing to doing that. Um, whether it's successful or not is a different story, but I mean, trying is what counts, right? Yeah. A question mm -hmm. we might probably get under the video is, do you have any job offers, Josefina? Let me know. <laughs> Sure, I will. I mean, we are small and we haven't grown much yet, but um, yeah, we will see how this goes. Perfect. I think I have two interesting contacts. Yeah, let's say one interesting contact who might benefit from your application, but we'll talk about it after the podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank you so much, awesome. Josefina. Maybe in the second part, we have Lynn on the show, so I'll have to contact him and ask him if he would be open to talk about Leap71 in a second episode. But yeah, thank you so much and uh, looking yeah, forward to hearing from you. You should. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Sure. All the best. See you. Thank you. See you bye soon. Bye.